pictures. And we all, we all like pictures. We like to see what's coming, what, what DHIS2 can do. So there are lots of pictures that we'll show about all the new features that are in DHIS2. So I'm gonna start by talking uh, very quickly through some of the high level features that we've introduced just in the last year. Uh, as Pummeled mentioned, there, there's a big team working on this. We have about 70 people at the University of Oslo that are building features and listening to all the requests that are coming in from all of you for what we need to uh, make this software better and make it more useful for the many, many use cases that are out there. Many, many ways that DHS2 is being used to make health better, to make education better, to make uh, all of the different programs that are so important in all of our countries, uh, have them be improved through digitization. So we'll talk through some of the uh, new features that have come in the most recent releases of DHIS2 uh, in the last year. And then my colleague, Phil, will join me uh, to talk a bit about the process that we have for reporting bugs, for getting issues in DHIS2 to the team so that we can fix them and get them back to you, uh, back, get the software fixed and make it better. Um, he'll also talk a little bit about the release process and how we re release DHIS2, how we make sure that we're doing quality testing for each release to make sure that what actually gets into the hands of all of you and in the, is in use in your countries is as stable and as, as high quality as possible. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's coming next. So we've, we'll, we'll start with what is already in the latest versions of DHS2 that has been released in the last year. Um, this is only within the last year, so there's already lots of other features that are in, in the software that we won't cover today. Uh, but then I'll also talk about what's coming next. And that hopefully will be an exciting, uh, exciting time to see some, some very cool features that are coming uh, in the next versions of DHS2. So just to start off, going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the last year. And Phil will talk a little bit more about this. But we've had quite a, quite a bit of activity, quite a few things that have come out of uh, the University of Oslo. Uh, the, most, the biggest ones are the major releases of DHS2. We've had version 39 and version 40 uh, within the last year. And we also had three versions of the Android capture application. So versions 2.7, 2.8, and 2.9. Uh, in addition to that, that's not all. We've also released patch releases to all the supported versions that many people are, in this room are probably running in your countries. We release patches with updates, with improvements, uh, with fixing of bugs, uh, and also in the case of very critical issues where we want to get something out really quickly, we have hot fixes. Uh, and Phil will talk a little bit more about this. So we've had 10 patch releases, 15 hot fixes, and many app releases as well within the last 12 months. I'll talk more about continuous delivery and what, what it means to release apps separately from the core uh, in a few minutes. I also wanted to touch on this, and um, it's a little bit uh, gr uh, grainy, the picture here, but uh, one of the major focus areas for us in the development of DHS2 is to improve the usability. So this means that we want to reduce the number of clicks and the amount of time it takes for people to do things that are very critical, like searching for a patient. When you have a patient in front of you, you want to find who they are in the system. You shouldn't need to spend two minutes or three minutes clicking through a bunch of different screens and trying to find that person. So we're working uh, on improving the usability and the experience of uh, working in DHIS2, not only on the Android Capture app and searching for patients, but throughout the whole system. This is an area where we're really uh, focusing in, in, our, in our efforts. So hopefully you'll see a lot of small improvements uh, in, the, uh, in different parts of DHIS2 in the interface that make very big impact on the actual workflows that, that everybody is doing every day. I also want to talk a little bit about the continuous release process. So as I mentioned, uh, we've moved in the last couple of years to a process where we release applications separately from the DHS2 core. So that means that we can get improvements and fixes to the applications that you run. So that's something like the maintenance app, the, data, the dashboard application, the data visualizer application. There are 30 of those that are built into DHS2. Other developers can actually build and share their applications as well. And those are all released independently. So we can get a, a fix out within a week uh, of, of hearing about an issue. Uh, and you can install it in a very low risk way to all of your actual production implementations as well. So this is a really exciting new, new way to release uh, uh, applications and fixes more quickly uh, while also maintaining the stability of the core that, that uh, we need to do a lot of testing to make sure is, is stable and ready to go. 
and Phil will talk a little bit more about this as well. Also wanted to touch but right before we go into the, the new features that are available in DHS2 on the testing that we're doing. So I'm talking a lot about quality. I'll tell, talk more about why that is uh, a little bit later. Um, but one of the big uh, successes in the version 40 release uh, is our beta test program. Um, and Phil's team uh, is the one that, that um, manages this, but we had seven different organizations around the world who have uh, or may support production implementations of DHIS2 who actually helped us to test before version 40 was released. So we had more than 11,000 tests performed by the, all, those, all those people uh, on making sure that things work in all the different many configurations that DHIS2 can take. Um, and we had a 96% pass rate, which is, it sounds like we should be aiming for 100, and we are aiming for 100, but it's actually a good thing that that isn't 100, because that means we found issues before this, this was released. So we either fixed those issues after we found them, or we made sure to document them and make sure that we're fixing them in the next patch release. Uh, so this is a, a, a really big uh, program, or, or, or important program, that we're continuing to expand with the future releases as well. Okay, so now what you're what you've all been waiting for the the pictures uh, of what's coming or what's new in DHS two in the last twelve months, and I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this. I had to take out a ton of uh, features that we have also introduced because we just don't have time, and a lot of them are are smaller or or take a longer time to explain. Uh, but I'm going to go through quickly about what's new in in the system, uh, and we're going to go through it, it kind of in order between uh, different, different ways that you can interact with the system. So we'll start with how you collect data. Uh, and this is what's new in collecting aggregate data. There are two, three different types of data in DHS2, aggregate data, event data, and tracker data, or individual data. Uh, and we'll start with aggregate. So the big news, the big uh, improvement in DHS2 is a, is a new data entry aggregate application. So the previous application has been around for more than 10 years. Um, it's it's quite a, a, a well used application. There's a lot of functionality in there. It's 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 one of the main things that people do in DHS2 is collecting aggregate data, um, and so it needed a refresh. And we've managed to do that, and we've released a new version of the aggregate data entry application. This is in beta, uh, but it will be migrated to to uh, full release in the next releases of DHS2. Um, but it has a lot of improvements. So uh, instead of needing to kind of navigate through the system uh, and lose track of where you are uh, before you start to enter data on the form, you always have your context available at the top of the screen. Um, so this is a, seems like a small improvement, but it lets you know that right now I am entering data for Nagelhoun uh, Community Health Clinic. I'm entering data for the January 2022 period. Uh, I can select which data set I'm trying to enter data for. So in this case, we're entering data for child health, uh, but it might be malaria, it might be a different program. So this gives you a clear idea of where you are in the data entry flow. We also have uh, uh, the ability to, to filter the org units or the, the areas where you're entering data based on where this data set has been assigned. So this is something that helps a lot uh, in if you if you're have access to multiple organization units and you're trying to enter aggregate data. Previously, you needed to kind of hunt and, and, and try to find which uh, organization units had this data set assigned. So this means that once you've selected that you're entering data for the child health program, you can very quickly find which organization units you have access to that also have this data set uh, available. We also have a, a new sidebar, which helps to give more information, more context to the, the data that you're entering. So in this case, you can see actually the, the graph of the history of values for this particular uh, field, which is um, fixed organization or fixed uh, facility type, uh, less than one year, fully immunized child. So I'm entering data there. I wanna see kind of what is the trend of this, this data over time, over the previous time. And also you can see the, the history of changes, the audit log um, of the people who have changed this value for this exact um, org unit and period selection uh, and many other things. But this, this side panel is available and it makes it very easy to see this while you're still entering data in the, in the system itself. Um, it also allows you to run validation rules and see the results of those validation rules very quickly. 
Uh, so this allows you to to quickly see that there there might be an issue with the data that you're entering. Maybe it's it's higher than normal. Um, you want to make sure that the the person that's entering that data knows that that validation uh, rule is is triggered, so that they can say, okay, maybe I need to review this. Maybe it's going to be flagged in the future. I need to make sure that this is the actual the number that I that is true. Uh, it also works offline. So the, the data entry application works offline. It synchronizes data. So you can enter data offline. And then when you have access to internet, you can synchronize it back to the server. Um, this is something that, that has uh, been supported in, in data entry for some time, but we've improved it. We've added the ability to really kind of uh, use a modern web technologies to do this in a much better way. We also have the ability to enter data for multi-select multi option sets. So if you have a data element that uh, you want to be able to select multiple values, uh, in aggregate data for data entry, you can now do this. Uh, so this is something that's been requested for a long time. Um, and it's coming soon to both Tracker and Analytics. So those are not available in version 40, but they'll be coming soon. Um, but this is this is something that's been requested for a long time. So what this might look like is you want to choose multiple colors. It, it, this is a very simple example, but you don't want to just choose red, blue, or green. You want to be able to choose multiple of those. Uh, so you can select multiple values for a particular data element. Okay, moving quickly along, we're going to talk about individual data. So this is the tracker product and entering data for um, at both events and tracker. First of all, this is uh, a, something that continually we work to improve, but I wanted to point this out, especially um, as, as has been mentioned a few times, the uh, important work that Sri Lanka did in, in kind of spearheading the, the efforts to address COVID-19 here in Sri Lanka, and then that spread all over the world. We have about 50 countries that are using DHS2 for COVID vaccination and surveillance. Um, and as part of that, we saw an, kind of an unprecedented scale of what data is stored in DHS2, specifically for individual data. So you're starting to track entire populations rather than just children, for example. You're, you're monitoring or putting the entire population of a country the size of, of Sri Lanka um, into DHS2. And this, uh, you're in addition to that, you're having massive vaccination campaigns for the entire country. So you have potentially tens of thousands of people trying to enter data at the same time or, or uh, a thousand different client, uh, clinics. So this is just an example of um, it, uh, a, a country. This is real real data, but the country is, is obscured um, of the, the performance of the tracker system uh, when it, we're talking about scales that are that are were previously uh, not seen um, in, in using DHIS2 or, or most health systems, to be honest. Uh, so we, were, we saw uh, incredibly high speeds of requests per minute that were served by the system, being able to search for, for patients very quickly, um, being able to enter data. So 4,000 event data values stored per minute um, throughout the country. So this is really a impressive scale that we've seen and we continue to, to improve the performance of the system thanks to this, uh, in these improvements based around the COVID uh, pandemic. The other big uh, um, enhancement that we've introduced to the tracker product or the individual data product is the implementation of the capture application, which is a, a much improved user interface for uh, entering this individual data to, for managing patients and, and, and people within uh, DHS2. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, the idea is that it's it's a very similar user inter interface. Again, you have the, the context that's always available in that top bar, but the form is very similar. Uh, and you have a migration from tracker capture, which again has been around for quite some time, has a lot of uh, quirks and, and things that are challenging to use, uh, to something that is a, a modern user interface, has modern technology, so it's very easy to uh, interact with and for people to, to navigate through. Here's an example of that. So this is, um, yeah, just another, uh, yeah, this is an enrollment dashboard. So being able to visualize a, a patient enrolled in a particular program um, and having a view to, to that uh, entry point into the system. I'm gonna go through these quickly because there's quite a few of them. 
Uh, you also have uh, widgets on this dashboard, so you can see things like the date of enrollment, a lot of the um, the transfers uh, that have happened. So this maybe this person started at one clinic and then they moved to another clinic. You can see some of that history here, um, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, you can also have a, a dedicated um, entry way uh, entry point for scheduling events. So not just recording events that already happened, but also scheduling events for the future. Um, which previously they, those were the same thing. Now they now they have a dedicated entry point or a de dedicated way to schedule future events as well. Uh, we also have a very important uh, concept of working lists that have been introduced to the capture application. So this allows you to see what are the patients that I expect to come in today, for example, or uh, many other ways you can you can have a working list for uh, someone to actually go out into the community and 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 visit certain households, for example. Um, lots of ways that this can be can be useful. Um, we also have the ability to assign events uh, for scheduled events in the future to individual users. So this allows you to take uh, uh, yeah an event that you've scheduled and say, I want this the, this health worker will be the one that's going to do this that shows up on their working list, and they have a a, a work log for that particular day. Um, we also have the ability to filter these working lists by data from different program stages. So you might have uh, multiple multiple events in a particular program. Uh, previously, it was difficult to, to kind of filter and say, I only want to see, uh, in this case, the, um, the births that were under uh, 2.5 kilograms of weight. Um, so th this allows you to say the birth is one, uh, maybe one stage in that program. I want to filter my working list and show only the, the patients that had uh, a, a, a underweight child, for example. Many other um, ways that you can use these working lists and the, the features that we have there, but you can also save these so that you can save a view with some complicated filters, for example, and use that in the future. So you don't have to continually uh, create these filters on demand. And I mentioned earlier the that a, a patient might start in one clinic and then move to another clinic. Um, in the past, it's been difficult to understand kind of if, I, if I'm trying to use uh, do analytics on a particular facility um, and I want to see a list of patients. Am I talking about the patients that are currently own or that, that are currently enrolled at that uh, clinic or the ones that started there or the ones that were there at some point? So we're introducing a lot of functionality for analyzing the ownership based on the ownership of the uh, patient in Tracker. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm saying patient a lot, but tracker is, is generic, so it can be things other than patients as well. So anything that is, is individually tracked. Um, so you can do uh, things like the, the current enro uh, the en enrollment, the, the organization unit where this patient person was enrolled, the where they registered the system, which might not be the same place where they were enrolled in a particular program, uh, where they uh, were enrolled at the beginning of a particular period, where they were enrolled at the end of a particular period. There's a lot of uh, ways that you can use this functionality to identify uh, people that have uh, been at different facilities over time. And I also wanted to point out, uh, this isn't actually a software feature, but uh, we have a very thorough uh, tracker design guide that's available on docs.dhs2.org. Um, I believe these slides will be shared, so you can follow the link. You can also just go to docs.jesus2.org, and you'll find the tracker design guide there. And this is a, a very thorough and, and useful uh, resource for how do you actually design a tracker program and use the tracker functionality in DHIS2 to, to, to meet programmatic needs. Okay, moving quickly along again, we're going to talk about offline and mobile. So we have an Android capture application. And this has been also significantly improved in the version uh, versions that have been released. Um, this actually, the, the features that I'll talk about here don't include version 2.9, which is coming out this week. So we have a new version of Android Capture App that's coming out this week. You can find out more about that when the release notes are, are, are published. It should be later this week. Um, but these are features that were introduced in the previous two releases, so in November of last year and May of this year. Um, much more flexibility in how you display and enter data for aggregate data, for example. In uh, in this case, it's aggregate data or data sets. 
in the Android capture application. So you can resize and drag columns. You can apply color themes to uh, be able to kind of identify uh, values. You can uh, use the, uh, a legend uh, to actually say, basically apply colors to different values within the system um, and lots of other enhancements to the usability of the data set entry form. Uh, we also have uh, improvements to the sync process, which can be quite cumbersome if you have to synchronize a whole lot of data every time you open up DHIS2. Uh, so it'll actually only load the full set of data that is needed, all the metadata, all of the configuration, all the values that are associated with this particular org unit uh, on the first load, and then it will dynamically adjust the amount of data that it downloads so that it only downloads exactly what it needs, which reduces the network consumption and the, and the time that it takes for people to actually start to enter data or, or activate the, the workflow that they're using. Uh, we also have uh, improved synchronization error feedback. So pr instead of just saying that the, the sync failed, and it's very difficult for somebody to understand why, it will tell you that uh, there, there's a, a particular problem with the age and years, for example, in this case, uh, that you might need to address before you can uh, successfully sync this data. This is a, a highly requested feature as well, uh, both of these, but being able to collect patient signatures or signatures. So being able to actually use the Android device to have somebody enter a, a signature, it's then saved as an image and associated with a particular event. So this is something that can be quite valuable for uh, gathering consent from patients. It also uh, can be used for, for uh, physician signatures, lots of other use cases as well. Um, and you have uh, it, more deep integrations with the operating system itself. So in the Android uh, ecosystem, you have uh, a, an email address field. You can now click a button and immediately open the email app on your phone directly. Similarly, a, a button for a, a phone number, you can open the, the phone application and immediately call that, that person if you have that data stored in a DHS2 um, tracker program, for example. Um, and similarly for URLs, opening that URL in a browser. And we have many other improvements as well. We weren't, don't have time to, to list all of them here and there are many more coming soon. Um, so improvements to the usability by making the, the tappable area for different parts of the screen uh, more uh, larger and easier to interact with. Um, we, the ability to have yeah, more feedback from the system uh, better offline user experience and uh, display of long text, things like that. This is part of the usability improvements that we talked about. Uh, and that's the main focus of this last release of uh, Android as well. So you'll see a lot of uh, improvements coming in, in the release that's coming very soon. This one is really exciting as well. So one of the challenges with large uh, Android deployments with DHS2 is that you have Android uh, devices all over the place. And those might be offline, they might be very many different versions of, of Android, uh, and you have to have 10,000 people install an application on their phone. Uh, that can be quite challenging. And D uh, the DHS2 Android Capture app is deployed through Google Play, which has automatic updates enabled by default. So unless you have an MDM, which can be a mobile device management system, which can be quite expensive, you have to uh, basically train all of your users to turn off that auto update or make sure that your system can handle those automatic updates happening on a rolling basis across all 10,000 of your users it can be quite complicated. So we've introduced an application, a web application to DHS2 that lets you actually upload or, or install a version of a specific version of the Android Capture app to your DHS2 instance. And then your Android users can install from that, uh, from the DHS2 instance itself. So not installing from Google Play, but going to the Ministry of Health HMIS uh, uh, DHS2 instance, for example, downloading that application, and then they're, they're fixed on that version specifically. And when the administrator of the system then goes and installs a new version of the Android Capture app, what's very uh, exciting about this is that the, the app actually will auto-update itself. So it will give you a notification to the user that says a new uh, version of this application has, is available and you can install it. And so that allows the, the administrator to control what versions are used by all of the people that are interacting with the system. And the, the, it doesn't uh, 
provide or doesn't cause any additional friction for the Android user to update their application. So as soon as that happens on the server, they get a notification, they can immediately go and, and update it uh, from within the application itself. This one was also very exciting. So we have uh, a lot of different use cases for DHS2. There are many, many things that are being done with the system. And as much as we try to optimize the, the workflows and the user interface for the generic product, there will always be things that, that could be done better if they were designed specifically for that use case. Uh, so Breno, uh, my colleague, will talk a little bit more about the use case for LMIS. Uh, we have developed a real-time stock management uh, functionality for the Android capture application, and that can be assigned to specific programs. So this is just the first of many uh, specific use case workflows for the Android capture application where you can specify for this program, I want a custom or a different, uh, a different workflow to be displayed to the user. Um, and so we have a, a use case configuration web application that lets you specify which programs should be assigned to which workflows. And you can, uh, yeah, and then you, it, it will seamlessly be available to all of the Android users in your system. So an example of that is this real-time stock management tool, which uh, I'll leave to, to the LMIS session for tomorrow to learn more about. But this is one example of a, uh, a, a specific workflow for entering stock data that's a little bit different. It's underneath the hood, it's the same uh, data model as all the other programs in DHS2, but there are ways to improve the, and I think we went from 15 clicks to three clicks to, to distribute some stock by moving to this workflow. So it can significantly improve the experience of the user to do a particular task. And this can be then assigned to specific programs for tracking stocks, for example, in DHS2. Okay, this one has the prettiest pictures. So this is very exciting. <laughs> We're gonna talk about analyzing data. So we've collected data already. We've collected aggregate data. We've collected data offline using the, uh, the Android capture application. We've also collected data using the capture app on the web. Now, what do we do with that? Uh, so we also have the ability to analyze data in DHS2, as most of you probably know. Uh, we have a data visualization app. Uh, we also have the line listing application to be able to visualize some individual data. We have a dashboard app where you can combine different types of visualizations, including maps, including uh, charts, including pivot tables, including line lists, as you'd like, uh, in the dashboard. And one of the very exciting features that came out in version 40 is the ability to add uh, custom calculations without defining a new in indicator within the data visualizer application. So as a, a user who maybe doesn't have access to create new indicators or, or doesn't even need, doesn't need to create new indicators for the entire system, they just wanna do some calculation, divide one number by another number or divide one number by a hundred or some sort of custom calculation. They can now define that in the visualization itself in data visualizer. So this means that you go in and you say, what data do you want to use? And you can define, as you can see up on the top right there, you can define a formula for how what you want to do. So you can do more exploratory analysis. You can define custom calculations that maybe don't make sense for the entire system, but would work specifically for this visualization. This is not saved as an indicator, so it doesn't pollute your, uh, your specific defined indicators for the entire system. It's saved with the visualization, so other people that access this visualization will also use the same calculation. We also have the ability to uh, apply legends to pivot tables. So being able to, um, oh, sorry, this is actually a line list, to apply uh, legends to values in this line list. So you can see quickly kind of the which which values are high, which ones are low. You can apply custom legends depending on what makes sense in your use case. Um, but this is much, much easier to read at a glance than something that is just text on a white background. And this helps a lot with uh, being able to analyze that information. And this is one that's been requested for a while as well. Um, we introduced the line listing application, I believe in version 38. Uh, yeah, it was 38. And uh, since then, the line listing application, which is a new version of event reports, uh, has not been able to be included on the dashboard. 
We now can include line lists on the dashboard. And because of continuous release, this can actually be done even if you're running 38 still. So you don't need to upgrade to 40 to get this functionality. And this is really powerful to be able to visualize individual data next to aggregate data, for example, in the, in the dashboard context. There's a whole session on maps in a couple days, so I'm not going to go spend too much time on maps today. Um, but I did want to mention this one uh, or a couple of features that are in, uh, have been included in the maps application. Uh, this one is the ability to customize the download and the print of a particular map. So this is very useful if you're trying to if you're trying to print out a map, you want to define where maybe some information about what uh, what this map is displaying. You want to make sure that you display the legend, maybe show a context of where this map is actually located. Uh, you can define all of that and customize the layout, and then you print a very nice looking uh, piece of paper or a PDF to, to display this or to share it outside of DHIS2. Uh, the other big functionality, this isn't actually in the Maps application. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a couple days as well on the Maps session but is the ability to uh, import data from Google Earth Engine. So we'll talk about more about what Google Earth Engine is and why that data is very useful in a lot of programs on, uh, uh, on Friday. But uh, this allows you to, um, for example, import population data from Google Earth Engine and actually uh, calculate the population estimates for uh, each of the org units in your system. So this lets you get very granular with the, the population estimates that can be helpful in programmatic work. We also have uh, the ability to, yeah, the, the introduce the ability to import that data. So this actually gets imported as a data element in the system, and then it can be used in a custom ca calculation and a visualization, for example. It can be used as the denominator and an indicator, if you would like. Um, and this is something that previously you could have this population information visible on a map but it wasn't easy to actually use that in uh, data analytics and, and in uh, analyzing data in the system. Um, we've also significantly improved the performance of analytics, so improved the performance of querying, as well as the performance of uh, generating analytics tables over version 35. And I'll, I'll talk more about this a little bit later, but you'll see much more uh, improvements in that as well um, coming soon. I did want to mention one additional thing. Actually, I think it is not on any of these slides, but I'll talk about it on Friday as well. Um, but Google Earth Engine, we have a relatively new uh, mechanism that's very easy for countries to uh, request access to Google Earth Engine. There's a ton of data that's available there, uh, and usually you have to you have to sign up, maybe you have to pay, but Country uh, governments can get it for free if they just send us an email. So we'll, we have a link to documentation. I'll talk about this on Friday. A very easy way to sign up and get an, uh, an API key or access to Google Earth Engine, which has a wealth of information on all sorts of things, from climate to population to land cover to rainfall to temperature, all sorts of uh, different layers and access to, to global data sets that can be very valuable. OK. Next functionality is about data exchange. So we introduced a new application or a new functionality into DHS2 for exchanging data between DHS2 instances. So this is really, really powerful. It allows you to, and there are several examples of how this can be used, uh, but this allows you from one DHS2 instance to perform maybe some aggregation of the data in that instance and then send it to another one. So this could be very useful for example, in this case, from a, a DHS2 instance uh, that's running tracker to send data to the HMIS so that the, the tracker data stays in a separate instance and that you have a, separate, a, a dedicated HMIS instance, you can send that automatically from one instance to the other. It can also be useful for global reporting for, to uh, donors such as the Global Fund or, or other, other places where you can actually aggregate and send specifically the data that makes sense from your system to uh, the global system without needing to re-enter that data. So it's automatically calculated, it's automatically aggregated and sent to a another DHS2 system. Um, so you send it from a source to a target. It uses the data value sets API. So it's always going to aggregate data, um, but the source can be either aggregate or tracker. So you can automatically say, count up all of the patients that match this request, and then you come out with a number that you insert into the aggregate data model. 
So this can be very valuable also when you have, uh, for example, programs that are maybe incrementally being adopted in tracker or individual data, but a lot of districts are still reporting in aggregate. You can combine that data by having the tracker data basically automatically aggregated and, and input into the same aggregate system. So you have, in the aggregate system, you have a holistic view of the entire program. Um, it's very important also, where, where is this? Um, yes. It's very important also that this can be done within the same system. So it doesn't need to be going to another system. If you have aggregate and tracker in the same system, or maybe you have a data set and a tracker program, you can do that aggregation uh, of the tracker data and put it directly back into the same database uh, as aggregate data. It's also significantly improved performance because you can pre-calculate those program indicators instead of calculating the program indicators on the fly all the time. So this is something that's very, very uh, powerful. We also have a web application for this, so you can review the data before you submit it. So if you're submitting to a global donor, for example, you, you don't wanna just send that automatically maybe, you want to take a look and see this is the data that will be sent to this uh, in this report. And then you can click submit and it will send right then. If you're doing a tracker aggregation, for example, you might want to do that automatically. That's also supported. So you can use it, do this as a scheduled job that runs uh, once a day, once a week, however you want to do, do it. And it will uh, run that in the background and do that automatically. But if you want to review the data, we have a web application to be able to actually see exactly the data that will be submitted and submit that actively. We have a number of other functionality that is related to extending DHIS2. And my colleague Morton will talk a little bit more about some of the uh, ability to integrate with other systems and the, the fe features that we have there. But I'm gonna go through them quickly here uh, as well. Um, one of those that just helps to interact with DHIS2 is open API specification. So this is something that has been requested for a long time. DHS, the DHIS2 API is huge. There's so much that you can do. It's very, very powerful, but it's hard to really understand what's there and figure out how you wanna specifically design a script or an application. So we've uh, implemented an open API specification that defines what, what is there and it lets you explore in a much, much easier to consume way, uh, the entirety of that API. Um, and that's actually generated as part of the, the development process. So it's not something that we need to keep in sync by writing documentation or that type of thing. It's actually produced by the, the, the process of creating DHS2 as software, and it makes it uh, always kind of up to date with that. Still things that we want to improve about this, but it's, it's a huge step forward in making it easy for people to interact with DHS2 programmatically. So this is just an example of what that looks like. It has an example of, uh, we were just talking about aggregate data exchange. There's a number of functionalities in the DHS2 API that you might want to use. This text tells you exactly what parameters that uh, API endpoint uh, expects, what it will give you back, what errors are possible, uh, those types of things. So it's very, very useful information. We also have the concept of web hooks or event hooks, which uh, Morton will talk about uh, tomorrow, I believe, um, or maybe it's the next day, I forget, <laughs> Friday. Um, and this is uh, also a very uh, widely requested and useful functionality basically to allow other systems to react when something happens in DHIS2. So if you wanna say, whenever somebody changes some metadata, I want to send a notification to some other system so that they can also update their, their metadata or they, maybe they do some processing and then they, they uh, have a, a subsequent update or something like that. So initially this supports metadata and scheduler. There's lots of different event targets. Morton talk, will talk more about this in, uh, as well. And we wanna support different types of events uh, that make it uh, even more valuable in the future. This is also uh, a, a feature that I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what this can do. Um, it's called the routes API. So this allows you basically to have a secure way to define some external service and route the requests from a DHS2 application, for example, through DHS2, uh, use the user model of DHS2 to, to make sure that only certain users can access that external service, that you don't need to share uh, the credentials for that external service with every user. 
it will automatically apply the authorization that you need and it will talk to that um, that service. Um, it might be a client registry. It might be a, a COVID vaccine generation service. There's lots of different use, use cases for this. And again, Morton will talk a bit more about this on Friday. Uh, and I won't get into this as well. There's a lot of additional uh, functionality that we've built um, in and around DHS2 as software for to make it easier to integrate with different systems and to build an integrated H, uh, health information system that involves multiple different components and it is, is a complicated architecture. So we're building out a, a suite of functionality for integrating and uh, interoperating between different systems. Uh, and we'll talk more about that again on Friday. Okay, that was the whirlwind tour of the, the last year of development in DHS2. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Phil, who will talk to us about uh, how to report bugs. So if you find issues in DHS2, what do you do about it? Uh, and how do we respond to it? And also how we release our software and what we do to make sure that it's high quality. And then I'll be back to talk to you about what's coming next as well. So with that, over to Phil. Um, oh, you can hear me now. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm Phil, and I'm going to uh, cover a couple of uh, aspects that are a bit more boring, but necessary uh, parts of our process. Um, as uh, yeah, as Austin said, uh, bug reporting and release cycles. So, um, is anyone here aware of any bugs in DHS two? No, we can skip. <laughs> okay, I mean, you know, bugs are part of the software development process. We all know that, but you know, they're they're really challenging and they can cause a lot of difficulty. They can make your job very hard. Uh, they can cause lots of frustration for end users, and they can uh, damage the the trust in the system. So it's very important to us to to make sure we we address them. But if you say bug to me. I say Jira. That's the way we track um, our bugs and make sure that we can actually deal with them. So you might ask, how do I access Jira? And I'd say, go to this, this URL. That's simple, right? Our team use this all the time. We know exactly how it works. It's very simple. It seems simple, but if you go there for the first time, first you realize you get redirected to, to this cloud site on Atlassian. Then if you've not been there before, you get you see various different uh, projects. You have to know to choose the DHS2 software project, maybe. If you don't have an account with Atlassian, when you try and create a, a, a ticket, an issue, a bug report, uh, you won't be able to until you create that account. And um, just as I started to put this uh, presentation together, I realized this isn't well documented and it's not a very easy process. Um, so we need to do better there for a start. And so that's something I think uh, I think we have to address and make it easier for people to get into the system to see what bugs are there and to be able to report bugs. But once you've reported a bug, um, I think often you want to know when that bug is gonna get resolved. And if you ask me that, I'd say it depends, right? Um, because it does, <laughs> it's very difficult it depends on a lot of factors, um, the criticality of the bug. So how we classify these bugs, um, you know, it's based on all of these factors and we have to prioritize, we have limited resources, we have to balance against the development work we're doing and so on. So that's always challenging, but what we should be able to do is, is let you see the status of bugs and let you see a bit more, have more transparency of our, our process. Because otherwise, we end up with this perception that bugs go to Jira to die. And we know this is a perception amongst um, many people. Um, and for good reason, because there has been a history of bugs not being acted upon, or at least it's not visible that anything's happening to them. So I don't want to really use this session to talk so much about how you report bugs, but I want to, to, to look at how we're trying to improve this process and to try and convince you that bugs don't go to Jira to die. So the start of this is that we're, we're growing and improving the, 
the QA team, the quality assurance team. Um, a few months ago, we took on a new QA lead, uh, Lina. She has a lot of uh, quality experience um, and uh, she's very de dedicated to the, the processes around quality for the whole team. Um, and so she's a great addition um, and a great leader for, for our team. We have Gita, who's been around for, for several years now. We have Hello and Haroon, who uh, joined a few years ago. Joseph, Joseph and Wedeka have joined us this year um, from the Sri Lanka team. So those guys represent uh, mostly uh, manual testing and regression testing components of our team. Then we have Adele, who joined us also this year as an automation, test automation engineer, looking at automated tests and so on. Um, and we have Nancy on the, the Android uh, testing side. So our team is growing and developing, and that also gives us more capacity, of course, to, to deal with problems. So one of the first things Lina started to do when she came on board was to, to look at this issue with JIRA and say, you know, how can we start to solve the JIRA problem? And some of those problems were that triaging of new issues was happening more or less ad hoc or when time allowed amongst all of the other uh, constraints that we have. We also had a general sort of unawareness um, of what bugs we have in the system. There are almost too many, so you lose a bit of visibility. And bugs weren't always updated. So that's a really problematic when the status is not actually reflecting what it, what it should be. So she resolved that we need to move to at least being able to acknowledge all newly created bugs within four weeks of their reporting, which is still pretty slow, but it's, it would be an improvement over what things were. She also wanted to try and make the process a lot clearer and make sure that our team has a better awareness of what bugs we have, and then that transparency can go back to, to, to you guys. So we took some very simple measures one was to make sure there was ownership of triage process and it was cons consistent and ongoing so that we could keep up with all of the, the issues coming in. Another one was just improving the dashboards and the way we're using JIRA so that we can actually get better visibility uh, of the bugs um, and the statuses. Another was using that visibility and working with the development teams to make sure they also had the visibility so they can address things and they can put priority and balance things with the, the rest of the, their work. And there was also some hard work of rechecking things and getting the statuses up to date and so on, but making that commitment to do so. So when, this, uh, when we first looked at this, um, we had this kind of status. Uh, we had 127 in open status on the 12th of July, as you see here, which is a high number. And many of those were had been there for several months. Um, we have some in needs info, which is where we're trying to get more information before we can move things on. So it's kind of still an open status. We had quite a lot in to do, which is basically the issues which we know are issues. They've been accepted by the team, but they're waiting to be uh, processed. That may always be quite high, depending on how you need to balance development and uh, maintenance and bug fixing. But we also had quite a large number of bugs in testing. So this was another blocking point. So both the, the, the initial triage, the opening, and the testing were two clear bottlenecks that we needed to address. So with these new uh, approaches, with this focus on trying to improve the processes, we within a couple of months moved to this, this second view where we only have a few uh, issues in open status. We may have still more in needs info, but that's, as I say, this is where we, we try and get back to the reporter and trying to get that additional info that we need in order to process the, uh, the ticket further. But this really low number of open issues is great. It means we now are keeping up to date on a daily and weekly basis and being able to respond and check and triage the issues. 
which is much better than we even had a target for um, with this four week uh, response time. We still have some in to do, but you can see that even that has gone down because we've actually also worked at processing some of these bugs and putting some, some effort in that direction. And there's still some work to do on the bugs that are caught in testing, but it's, it's going down. And this has continued to, to go in this direction um, since the, this, this September uh, set that I've got here. So just the, oh, I don't know whether you, yeah, you don't see this. Yeah, there we go. The trend over the same time shows the same picture, basically, that uh, the bugs uh, created uh, is much lower than the bugs resolved through this period. Uh, there are some significant peaks where we've resolved quite a lot of bugs. That's because we've had a particular focus of some of the dev teams to go through, move their focus from development and do pure bug fixing for certain periods. And we can see that the, the really positive impact that this has, have, this, this has had in terms of, you know, going through and breaking down this, some of this backlog of, of uh, bugs. So just in conclusion on, uh, on the bug side, we're really actively working to try and make this process work better, okay, so that we can actually deal with the, the important issues uh, that are blocking you guys. Um, and we're, we're also trying to work to make the bug status clear in Jira. This isn't really in place yet, but we've got ideas to try and um, simplify the process and just make it a lot easier for you to understand where these issues are in in uh, in in terms of their state and so on. So, we we do really want you to raise your issues in Jira. It's very important that they're in the system for us to be able to even acknowledge them and and deal with them. This is you know, don't give up on Jira, please. Put your put your issues in there, and we do want you to give us as much useful information as you can to help us understand the problem. Otherwise, we will have to push back and try and get more information and it slows down the process. We are looking at ways to try and improve this as well, like adding templates that will prompt you for, for the right sort of information that we need, um, but yeah. Okay, so moving on to release cycles. I think most of you probably know a bit about how we do releases. Um, so this might not be too much new information, but. I, I thought it'd be useful to step through the types of releases we do and look at the various aspects of what, why we do those different types of releases. So first concentrating on uh, the core releases. Um, I think we all know we have these major releases. So these are examples of like version 40, version 41 next year. We now try and refer to these, as you may know, without the 2, 2.40, 2.41. I may even refer to version 37 instead of 2.37, but they're synonymous. If you say 2.37.10, that's fine. If you say version 37.10, that's also fine. But we're trying to move away because the nomenclature helps us uh, indicate the, the kind of type of release a bit better when we drop the 2, basically. But it's a long process. This too is everywhere, and uh, it's it's difficult to get rid of, basically. So, as Austin mentioned, we now we have a yearly release cycle of these major releases. We've moved from a six-monthly cycle. This is based a bit on feedback and our understanding of how implementations uh, uh, plan their up upgrade process. Right? We know that that's a challenging thing for for everyone both upgrades, updates of patches, and so on, for various reasons. Um, and this, we think, gives a good balance between um, the, the speed at which we can bring new features, uh, like uh, Austin is, is, is uh, presenting, and the ability to maintain the older versions. So with a yearly cycle, if we're still supporting three versions, those versions actually um, maintained for three years before they go out of support, for example, if we continue along this uh, yearly uh, cycle. The focus of, ma of major releases is mainly to bring these, these cool and major new features uh, that, that require quite big updates 
to the system. We also fix all the bugs that are relevant for that version that are still applicable to that version. We'll fix those as we fix them in, in the, the maintained versions too, of course. There are usually model updates with these yearly major releases, which means you it's very unlikely. I don't think we've ever had a release where you don't have to have some database uh, model changes. So you generally can't downgrade once you upgrade. And that's an important part of you know the, the approach to how you do the upgrades and how you test and prepare for those, of course. We perform extensive regression testing on major um, releases by our internal team, which also extends to the beta testing program that, um, that Austin mentioned. So we try and cover as much, uh, many of the use cases as we can. But of course, you know, you can use DHS2 in so many ways, you can configure it in so many ways, we can't cover every scenario. So it's still very important that implementations test their own use cases extensively before upgrading. Okay. The next type of release are the patch releases. Again, the examples are the next version number. So it's 40.2, for example, 41.1, uh, 37.10, as I mentioned. The frequency of these is supposed to be roughly bimonthly, so every couple of months. It can vary a bit based on other based on certain factors. If we have challenging time testing, if we find problems, those things can delay. If a previous patch release for another version got delayed, it will push on and so on. Uh, we may adjust and juggle the order of releases around in order to accommodate uh, critical needs of certain versions under some cases. But we try and stick roughly to this uh, uh, bi-monthly release. The focus is maintenance and bug fixing. We do include some new features, but we try and limit those. We try and be conservative so that we keep the stability of these patch releases. There can be model updates. Not always, but there are quite often, I would say, model updates, even in the patch releases. So also, they, they're problematic to downgrade. In fact, you can't, you can't just upgrade to a patch and then go back, roll back to the previous patch in most cases. The regression testing we do is much more limited than in the major releases. We have a much shorter turnaround time, so that limits what we can do. We try and prioritize in, on, on the, the areas that we test based on what's been uh, modified. Uh, we're trying to extend the beta testing process into the patch release cycle as well to increase uh, the coverage, but but yeah, compared with the, the major releases, that's just the, the nature of it. So again, testing before upgrade, very important. Your key use cases, run through these in a test environment, make sure it's working and you should be okay. Finally, the next number in the version is the hotfix. So the examples 40.2.1, 41.1.2, if it was the second hotfix of the 41.1 patch, for example. These are, these are created on demand. So we don't plan for these. We do them if it's necessary to get out a critical issue, which is the main focus of these. Critical issues could be things that have impact with data integrity. Um, they could block certain use cases or security vulnerabilities are a key one where we might need to quickly roll out changes. They usually wouldn't include a model update. So it's actually possible to go to a hotfix. If there's some issue with it, you should be able to drop back to the, the patch below the hotfix. We don't do regression testing. These are very small changes, very isolated. We test around that area. We run what we call smoke testing, which is making sure the, the system generally works and the different apps all start up, but we don't do any of the regression testing. We want to get these things out fast, but we keep the risk very low. Um, as I say, it should be almost identical to the previous patch, but with just these, these critical fixes in place. So do you test before upgrade? Hmm. Ideally, yes, it depends how quickly you need to get it get these out, but the risk is very low. So sometimes you will need to be able to apply this this quite quickly. Um, yeah, as I say, in an ideal world, 
you would be able to to test this quickly. You'd have a a test environment where you can you can quickly just validate some of your your key use cases to make sure they're not impacted. Finally, as a separate thing, uh, Austin mentioned that app releases now have this independent cycle where we call them continuous delivery. So examples might be the capture app version 100.45.0 of the line listing app 100.10.4, so on. So these have a varied frequency, I'd say, which I'll show in a moment. But we try not to have them too uh, frequent because that's less useful. We try and kind of have more batches of, of, of updates. Um, but yeah, they can be typically maybe weekly, maybe monthly. It depends a bit on the, the app, you know, and how much development is going on on a, on a particular app or how much maintenance, how many bugs and so on. The focus is both features and bug fixes. So it's just um, sort of incremental uh, changes um, depending on how we prioritize these. Um, you can actually see based on the version numbering. So the sort of second number indicates that features are, are added. The, the third, the minor number, indicates uh, the bug fixing to some extent. Downgrading is well supported on these. They generally don't change anything. Uh, well, they don't change anything with your data model. Um, they generally can just be uh, applied to your instance and then you can roll back if you want. Uh, so there's very low risk being able to just um, apply the new version on your production system. So just to kind of summarize those things, this is uh, a little kind of view of what the, the core releases look like um, over a yearly cycle. We'll go from one major version to another and we'll be releasing patch versions. Usually they'll actually be uh, staggered in terms of like the different versions, uh, not all released at the same time. But that's roughly what our, our kind of plan looks like throughout a year. Um, there may be periods like holiday periods where you see different sort of uh, times between um, maybe a few months instead of a couple of months and so on. And then you've got these continuous um, releases of the apps going on uh, in parallel. I just wanted to show, finish with this this picture of the app releases. I don't know how clear it is actually from from a, a distance, but uh, this is just over the last six months. Each one of these lines is one of our core supported apps, uh, and the dots along the lines are the releases of those apps. So this green one is the capture app, uh, pretty regularly releasing. Uh, up here, for example, is the maps app. Uh, here we have the data exchange app, and so on. But you can see there are, they vary, but there are a lot of releases um, coming out for these apps. Um, and it's, it's a great way of keeping these things, as, as Austin said, up to date and keeping the fixes, getting the fixes in there fast as we need. So um, yeah, I'll hand back to the more exciting stuff again from uh, Austin, thank you. Thanks, Phil. And Phil thinks this is boring, but it's very important. And uh, I, I think, I think people were a little bit shy when you asked if there were bugs in DHIS two, because we all know that uh, all of those features that I talked about that were added in the last year, that's a lot of things, right? And that's only a subset of what is in DHIS two. So the surface area of what we have to test, what we have to make sure is stable, is huge. So there will be issues, and that's a that's a. I'm sure everyone has found an issue in Facebook or an issue in in Google or Microsoft Word at some point. Every software has issues, and what we're trying to do is really build a process where we can listen to the most important issues and figure out, make sure that we identify them as quickly as possible and get them fixed. So it's really it's really really is important. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what's coming next for DHS two. So we have a, a new release, uh, version 41, coming in May of 2024. And we've taken a little bit of a step back to focus on these three things for that release. Um, quality, design, and extensibility. I talked a little bit about design already. Phil talked a little bit about quality. We'll talk about 
extensibility or kind of the, the underlying infrastructure that makes DHS to a platform that is extensible and configurable. Um, and the, why, why these three things? It's because the, the footprint of DHS2 has grown so much over the last five years, 10 years even, that there are many, many tens of thousands of people using it every day, uh, 100 plus countries that are using DHS2 or have DHS2 being used. Um, and they're all relying on this underlying platform to be stable, to be usable and, and effective for the workflows that you're trying to optimize and to be able to be configured and, and customized for the adapted to the local context and the local use case. So these are really critical things that they're, none of these are, are flashy new features, right? These are, these are mostly things that are uh, easy to forget about and when we're just trying to push, push the use cases forward. So it's really important for us to keep these at the top of our mind uh, and also to communicate to you that these are things that are important to us and that we are trying to, to build into DHS2 to make sure that it is a stable and useful and uh, custom uh, adaptable platform for all of you. So what does that actually mean? Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, um, but there's a number, a number of things that we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on stability, um, making upgrades less painful and less uh, possible to cause problems, limit regressions when we introduce features. So we're adding a lot of quality process and people to our teams to be able to make sure that we can test when we introduce a new feature, we're not breaking some other feature accidentally because there's so much going on. Um, we're trying to also really focus on performance. I showed the, um, the graph of the performance for uh, uh, for the COVID-19 use cases, but that's just the beginning, right? There, there are a lot of places where DHS2 is being used in, in huge programs, nationwide uh, vaccination campaigns, um, more and more programs being ado adopting uh, DHS2 for individual data, but also aggregate data. Um, analytics runtimes are very slow sometimes, and we wanna make that as fast as possible. So really focusing on performance and making sure that the software is fast and it is uh, useful so that you can actually get the data when you need it and act on that data is very important. So that's another, another focus. I mentioned design and usability a bit earlier. Um, also just quality of life. So being able as a user of DHS2 to have a, have a, a quality experience and, and, and really be able to interact with the system in a way that makes sense, in a way that is easy to train, it's less expensive to train, that it's easy to navigate through the system to understand what's going on. Um, that's something that, that is easy to kind of forget about uh, as, we're, as we're constantly pushing and adding new features is how does somebody kind of just interact with DHS2 as an entire product? So that's another, another area that we're trying to focus on. Consistency is another one that we've made huge strides in the last few years uh, to address, is that you might have multiple applications within DHS2, they should all look basically the same, right? At the, at the top level, you should be able to understand that you're interacting with DHS2, you have a way to navigate to other applications, you have a way to log in and log out of the system that should be the same no matter where you are. Uh, so really improving the consistency both of our applications and our uh, pieces of the software that we build on top of the platform, but also what other people build. So there are uh, many uh, developers and organizations out there that are building apps for DHS2, either to customize DHS2 for a particular country or particular use case, or to share and to, to make it, uh, basically to add a piece to the ecosystem that many, many different countries could use. And so we want that all to be uh, as easy as possible to develop and to build and to maintain, but also to make it a consistent experience for a user of DHS2 that's interacting with many different applications that might be built by UIO, that might be built by a HIST group, that might be built by a, a country uh, ministry. Make it as easy as possible for the, the experience of the user to be familiar and to be easy to understand and, and to learn. And the last piece of design here is accessibility, which is making it more uh, easy for, for people with um, maybe uh, d vision deficiencies or um, other ways of interacting with uh, uh, software to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to more effectively use DHS2 because it's being adopted by more and more people. Um, this is very important. 
And then the last piece here is, is extensibility. Another way to say this is, is kind of the infrastructure, the underlying uh, foundation of DHIS2. Um, so we talked about continuous delivery. That's, that's a, a kind of a fundamental piece of the infrastructure to be able to release applications, to be able to install new applications, to be able to roll them back when there's an issue, to be able to understand how those applications are being used. We have the App Hub that lets us uh, deploy applications as well as other uh, developers in the community to share them. Uh, that's all infrastructure that we've built and we continue to want to improve that to make it easier for people to, to, to share and to use those uh, extensions. Um, some of the underlying technology of the, the platform itself uh, might need to be changed. And that might not mean a new, uh, uh, a new feature for DHS2, but it might mean that instead of uh, uh, 10 hours to run analytics, it takes two or it takes one. So those, that requires kind of a, a new way of thinking about the technology and maybe some new technologies to be employed. Uh, and that requires some effort to get to that point. So that's something that might not seem like a flashy new feature, but it will really be a step change in how DHIS2 works and how it can be used. Um, and then additional extension points throughout the system. So we've talked a lot about applications. You can build applications, you can share them, you can install them in your system. There are many that we as UIO build and that you can install and update, but there are other places that you might want to extend DHIS2 as well. Um, uh, probably Morton will talk a little bit about some uh, different services that might be running on the server side. You wanna be able to kind of manage and share those extensions in a similar way. Uh, you also want to be able to uh, maybe uh, adapt just one field in the capture application to be able to, uh, you, I'll, I'll show an example of this, to be able to enter uh, a code and use an external API to look up that code, uh, maybe to look up a, a demographic information about a patient from a national ID system, for example. Uh, there are lots of additional point places where we want to add extension points where people can plug in and adapt just a small piece of DHIS2 to, to make it fit their needs. And all of this uh, functionality, a lot of that was under the hood, but the features that you saw that we built in the last 12 months and the ones that I'm going to show more pretty pictures of in just a minute, um, it's all, as Ulla mentioned earlier today, it's all a community-driven process for developing this roadmap and figuring out what, what is the most important thing that we need to build. So we have an annual prioritization process where uh, from the countries to the HISP hubs, this group here today, uh, to UIO, we, we gather up all of the, the input that we can to be able to understand what are the most important things that we can build that will have the most impact for the most people. And again, I mentioned DHS2 is used in 100 countries. There are hundreds of DHS2 instances all over the world that are being used at various different scales, various different programs, education, health, climate, you name it. Uh, it's, it's a big task to be able to, to gather all of that input and then synthesize it and try to figure out what is, the, what is the one or 10 features that we can build that will have the most impact here. So we really want to engage all of you as much as possible in that to learn about what is missing from DHS2 today that you would help your programs improve? So similar to what Phil asked uh, earlier, I would like to sh uh, uh, just a, sh a show of hands. Does anybody have at least one request for DHS2? And anyone have a request for something that they would like it to do that it doesn't do today? I, I have many, so I'm gonna raise my hand, but please, please raise your hand if you have something that you would like to do, like it to do. Come on, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard requests from half of you already. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's important, right? Like, there, there are a lot of requests and maybe some of those are the same request. And we wanna make sure that if there are 10 people that are requesting the same thing, that's something we should think about and we should really figure out how we can do it. So this is a community driven process. We have an annual prioritization process and we also have a, a public roadmap available. So you can see what's coming soon. We're working on updating and improving the, the um, uh, the information that's shared in this public roadmap, but you can find it at dhs2.org slash roadmap. Okay, so I'm gonna talk quickly about extensibility, but then I'll get into the pretty pictures and the new features that are coming soon. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of extension points, and this is something that we're, we're really focusing on to be able to add additional ways to extend DHS2 in a, in a standardized way with performance and security and a lot of other things taken into account. Um, 
the, the truth is that uh, an extension to DHS2 is rarely just an application. There's a lot more that goes on to actually make it work. Uh, and so we're, we wanna build some of the infrastructure to make that possible. Uh, an example of this is plugins. So we, you might know that we have the ability to put a plugin on a dashboard. So a, a developer could build a, an application, a mini application that, that lives in one of these squares on the dashboard. Um, but we wanna extend that to other places as well, like, like in Tracker. We also wanna make improve consistency by kind of pulling out the common parts of the platform outside of the application and being able to provide that in a standardized way. This is an example, just a, a hypothetical example, but an example of what you might be able to do with tracker plugins, right? So you have a, a capture application or tracker capture in the, uh, and you're entering data for a particular program. But maybe you're, you will need to put in an ICD-10 diagnosis or ICD-11 diagnosis, or you need to enter data from a, a, a national ID and then want to fill in all the rest of this information automatically. How do you do that today? Today it's it's difficult to do, and uh, we have certain value types that are supported, but ICD-11 isn't one of them. WHO drug isn't one of them. Those are things that there are many, many different ways that you might want to uh, interact with an external system or to select data. So what this allows any developer to do, and we'll build some of these, but others will build them as well, is to customize the experience of just entering this one field, or maybe two or three fields. So to be able to say, I want to look up this patient in a national ID system, or I want to open the ICD-11 coding tool. This says ICD-10, but we're gonna show the ICD-11 coding tool. Um, oh, that's not right. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so it might be a custom experience where you open something that's a very sophisticated uh, search experience. You need to narrow down the diagnosis and then figure out what the syn synonyms are and figure out what the actual code is for this exact uh, case. That's That might be a very complicated interface that, that we don't want to uh, hard code into DHS2 itself because it might change over time. There might be 10 different types of coding systems that you need to support. So this uh, extensibility or this extension point allows us to uh, a developer to build something like this, a customized experience just for this one piece. And importantly, they don't need to reinvent the entire data entry flow, right? So all, they can still use Capture App for all of the other data elements. They can still use Capture App for the, the tracked entity uh, dashboard. They can use it for um, being able to, to create new events. Uh, they just want to customize this one piece. And so this significantly reduces the work and the maintenance that is required to customize something in this way. This is just one example of uh, the types of extensions that we want to support. Another one is Android app modules. So <clears throat> in the Android application, right now you can build your own custom app Android application. Many people do. Um, you can use our SDK to build it in a more effective way. But maybe you don't, you don't need a full custom application. You just want to customize uh, like we saw, and we'll see more about uh, tomorrow, the, uh, uh, the the workflow for a particular program. But the rest of it, so being able to synchronize, being able to log in, being able to select the program, uh, apply settings, all of that, uh, other programs are, are just the standard workflow. So you want to just customize that one piece of that one uh, of that one program. That's a module or a widget within the Android application that we want to support uh, being more dynamic and being able to load that um, uh, on demand. <clears throat> Stock management tool is one of those. You might have others um, and be able to support developers to build just the, just the custom workflow for a single program, for example, and other ways to extend the Android application without reinventing the entire wheel. And there's more more coming soon as well in terms of how to how do we manage uh, a more complicated topology of server architecture. Um, so this is uh, kind of a representative diagram, but there there's more that we want to do to to support this use case as well. All right, now for the pretty pictures. Uh, I'm going to go through quickly. I have ten minutes left. Uh, I will talk through some of the things that you'll see coming soon in future releases of DHS2. Many of these will be available in May of next year in version 41. Some of them will be continuously released before or after version 41. Some of them will be in 42, but these are all things that are coming soon. They're on our roadmap that we want to do. Um, the first is what the screen that everybody has seen uh, probably a thousand times is the login screen. 
So this might look familiar, um, but it might also look a little bit different. So we're, we're replacing some out, outdated and, uh, technology in the login screen, but we're not changing the look and feel. So it's, it's basically the same thing that you're familiar with. Um, it's just uh, kind of under the hood, it's, it's, it's a little bit nicer. Um, but this is just one way to log into the system, right? We've seen many, many countries, many, many implementations. They want something different than this. They want to show some logos. Maybe they want to show a video with a, with a, a tutorial for how people should log into the system or how sh people should use DHIS2. Maybe they need to uh, link to some documentation somewhere or make sure that you have a link back to the ministry website, lots of those types of things. So uh, that's, that's also going to be supported in the new version of the, the login application. This is just an example of the, the create account functionality. Um, it's improved from what, uh, what we had before. Um, and it, obviously this is an optional uh, feature that you can enable or disable. But maybe you want to show a bunch of images, right? So this is something that today you can do, but it's it's quite hard to do. You have to you have to do um, hire a developer to do some very hacky things to make this possible. Uh, this will be supported out of the box. So we'll have a number of themes for the login page with things like show the show the login dialog on the sidebar and show a big image on the on the right. Um, you might also, uh, we also have improved support for uh, two-factor authentication, which is increasingly adopted for security within DHS2. Previously, you had a checkbox where you had to say, enter, enter a code. People don't really know what that code is. They don't know if they need to check that checkbox. That's, that's gone in the new version. You, just like many other services, you enter your username and password, you click login. And if you have two-factor authentication enabled, you see this uh, additional dialog, which shows enter your code. Uh, and you can have additional instructions for how to do that, those types of things. Um, but if you don't have that enabled, you never see this, you don't have to worry about it, it doesn't confuse people. Um, th this also allows you to fully customize that theme, right? So we, we talked about themes for DHS2, you might have the, the sidebar with an image. Um, this is not a pretty color, especially not on this screen, but, uh, but you might wanna customize it completely, right? You might wanna have, um, some links in there. You might want to have, like I mentioned, a, a, a YouTube video. You might want to have custom colors that match your uh, your country, or you want to have logos for all the different supporters of this particular project. That's all possible, and you can do it without writing any code, without building a custom application. You just uh, uh, either use one of the built-in themes, or you design a theme yourself using HTML and CSS and images. Okay, this is a big one. We're gonna talk about maintenance. So the maintenance application has been around for a long time. There's a lot of power and a lot of flexibility in it, uh, but there's many things that we know we could do better uh, and we're going to do that. So we are launching a new version of the, the maintenance application, which makes it much easier to manage the extensive configuration of DHIS2. This includes things like bulk editing, which has been requested for a very long time. So you can filter a list of all of the data elements in this case. You can select the ones that you want to do and you can do bulk sharing, you can do bulk editing of that fun of, of that list of, of data elements, for example. Um, it also has much improved user interface and makes it easier for people to, uh, to discover where sharing settings are, for example, those types of things. This is an, just an example of kind of the form that would be used to, to edit a specific ANC data element. It's similar to what we've seen before, but really the, the bulk editing is the power of that functionality. We also have uh, significantly improved in uh, organization unit management. So this is something that is quite complex to manage because you have a tree a hierarchy of different organization units at different levels. Uh, this allows you to do things like uh, merge different organization units to download a set of things that you select, in this case, organization units, to move those from one district to another, for example, uh, move things within the hierarchy. And this is just the beginning of what m could be possible with this improved interface. Here's an example of what it would look like to merge different organization units. So you might, you need to define kind of, all right, we're merging these two facilities. What do we do with the data in those two facilities? Do we put those together? How do we do it? Do we delete it all? What, what, what makes the most sense? So this is a, um, a pretty sophisticated workflow for how, how do you actually apply this? And then it, 
the merge actually happens on the server side, so it's not something that needs to be done manually. So there's, that's just the beginning. You see there's a lot of other um, uh, types of objects that we'll be supporting, different, thing, different operations for bulk editing, uh, and many more to be able to manage metadata. All right, I'm, I have six minutes left, so I'm gonna move a little bit quickly through these, these next things, but hopefully it whets your appetite and you can come and talk to me more if you wanna learn, learn more about what we're doing here. So now we're gonna move into Tracker. Uh, this, or sorry, this is a Tracker Analytics. So in the line listing application, uh, we have enrollment and event line lists today. So you can see uh, based on a program or based on an event program, you can see a list of events. Uh, but this allows you to instead see a list of tracked entities or people in this case, right? So you're, you're not, you might have people that are enrolled in multiple different programs. You want to uh, show a list of, of uh, people across those. So you want to actually list the, the tracked entities directly. This will be supported. Another, another um, uh, name for this is, is tracked entity line lists or cohort an analytic. This allows you to select the, the attributes of that tracked entity and list those people directly. We also have uh, pretty exciting things uh, coming for dashboards. So uh, you might know that dashboards uh, can get quite unwieldy to manage when you have a lot of them. Maybe you have uh, a dozen or, or two dozen or a hundred different dashboards configured in your system. So we're we'll, we'll be introducing better ways to manage the dashboards in your system. So this is a dedicated interface for managing uh, a, a large number of dashboards, being able to, to navigate through them and to, uh, yeah, to, to manage all of the, all the different ways to visualize analytics within your system. This also allows us, because that management is, is kind of extracted, to make the, the actual viewing of the data much simpler and much stri more straightforward. So you'll see that a lot of the a lot of the buttons that are there on the dashboard today are gone. This makes it easier. It may, brings the data to the forefront, right? So you're really just seeing the numbers, seeing the graphs, seeing the maps, um, and and the editing experience, the the kind of configuration is is hidden from from the main view. This makes it easier for people to understand and for for people to interact with. Yeah, and the, we also have uh, the ability to kind of highlight specific visualizations on this dashboard and to show additional information about that, that what that is actually showing you, right? So you can uh, highlight, this might be a graph, it might be a, a map. Uh, you can show details about what, what information is being displayed here. Uh, you can actually investigate what is, what is the data that we're seeing. And you can also do interpretations and, and visualize those interpretations so you can share what what, how you interpret this data with other people in the system. Okay, moving on to Tracker. We're significantly improving the ability to uh, refer and transfer uh, individuals between different facilities. So this might be from a clinic to a lab. It might be between two different facilities. You have temporary transfers. You have permanent transfers. Uh, all of this is supported, and we also are adding the ability to have not only the referral, but also the response to that referral. So you have a referral from a, a facility to a lab. The lab needs to respond and say, yes, I saw this person. This was the result, or yes, I accept this, this person into my, into my facility. That, that uh, can all be configured in the system and can be uh, you, uh, performed within the capture application. I'm going to touch on this. I've, I've mentioned it a few times, but we're continuing to improve the usability of the Android capture application. This is a, a big highlight of the 2.9 release, which is coming out very soon. And you'll see more and more improvements here. So you can see at a glance these patients and the, some of the key information about them uh, without needing to click on and, and na navigate to individual uh, pages for each of these patients. You can more quickly search and enroll new patients. Lots of improvements there. We also have the ability to uh, configure complex data exchange between different DHS2 systems. So I mentioned earlier the new data exchange service and the application for manually reviewing and submitting that data. We now are gonna be introducing just uh, within the next uh, month or two, uh, a, a application that can be used in any version that supports data exchange of DHS2 the ability to uh, visually configure 
that exchange system so that there's a lot of complex things that you need to to manage to map between your local system and the remote system to fit to determine how to aggregate uh, tracker data into analytics all of that is supported in this um, uh, configuration application all right i'm excited about this one too um this is a, a new way to navigate through dhs2 as a whole system so it's a it's an upgrade to the uh, the apps menu, which allows you to uh, very quickly use the keyboard to search through and find the applications that you care about. Um, but it's not just applications. So applications are you can search through today. Um, we're improving the ability to use the keyboard to navigate through these menus. But in addition to applications, we also have shortcuts. So you might be searching for data visualizer or data. And you don't, we don't know if you want to go to the data visualizer application, the data quality application, or to go to the data elements screen in the maintenance app. So this introduces uh, something that was in previous versions of DHS2 specifically for maintenance only, being able to navigate to specific subsections of that application. But this makes it available to every app in DHS2. So you can navigate to uh, the uh, pivot table screen of the data visualizer application. You can navigate to uh, creating a new pivot table, to opening a pivot table, to opening a new visualization, uh, lots of things like that. So being able to kind of uh, let people who don't maybe know where pivot tables are in the system, they don't need to know that that is in data visualizer. They just search for pivot and then they find the pivot table uh, pivot table section of the data visualizer application. So it makes discoverability much better. So this is just an example of a lot of the, the types of shortcuts that we envision and we, we make this also extensible so that custom applications can define their own shortcuts. We can continue to add shortcuts over time and it makes it very easy to navigate through the system. We also have commands. So this is uh, really exciting to be able to open contextual help, for example, from anywhere in the system, to be able to define an indicator without leaving the data visualizer application. There's a lot of very cool things that we can do with this kind of fundamental uh, functionality, in addition to some very basic things like clearing the cache without moving to the, clear, the cache cleaning application, uh, logging out from anywhere in the system, et cetera. And this is my last two slides because I know my time is up, but underneath the hood, we're also significantly investing in improving performance and security. So security testing, improved analytics runtimes, program indicator performance and management, expanding the beta testing program, having more robust import and export support, as well as, in, as I mentioned earlier, investing in new technologies and new uh, functionality to be able to significantly improve the performance of databases. We're talking 10x or more, not, not 20 or 30% faster. Improved usability and accessibility and improved ability to build really scalable systems that support huge populations managed within DHIS2. And with that, I hope that you are still with me and have enjoyed the, the pretty pictures of what, what is new in DHS2 and what is coming soon in DHS2. And I believe it's time for lunch. So thank you all very much. All right, that was a lot of information. Uh, and I've just been told by Pamud that I, uh, I can take questions. Um, I hope you have questions, but also I know that I won't be able to answer all of them. So please, uh, <laughs> if you have some questions that are burning from what you just, uh, just saw here, please let me know and we can talk through them. I, I will also be around for the, the rest of the week. So please uh, feel free to find me and I will connect you with the team or answer those questions directly. But if anybody has any questions right now, um, I believe Pomod has a microphone and we can, uh, yeah, we can address those questions. Hello everyone. And thank you Austin for the nice uh, presentation. Just, I wanted to ask about tracker plugins, uh, in which yeah. version plan to be available and is it support the attributes or only the elements? 
It's a good question. So the uh, yeah, um, the first version of tracker plugins will be in version 41, which is coming very soon. So we already have an alpha available and people that are developing the first versions of these uh, plugins. The first implementation will be just data elements, but then we can pretty quickly expand to other places within the capture application, such as attributes, such as widgets on the, the tracked entity dashboard, uh, and a number of other places. So we're building we're building the infrastructure and we'll have that in place and we should be able to expand it quickly to, to other places as well. Um, but the first version will be in 41. And also because this is um, uh, primarily a, a front end feature, it's something that we can continuously release once we have the basic infrastructure in place. So it should be able to, to be continuously released with the capture application even after the, the version 41 release. Great, any, any additional questions? There must be at least one. Don't be shy. About new features, Anand, what's... Anand has one in the uh, in the front. So what is the use uh, lock in drop-in pays? Yes. So that's actually uh, uh, quite required by many his yeah. quite long ago. The reason is to we have to branding the yeah. our implementation. So if the all implementations, so Bangladesh have five instances, but all has the same page. So nobody is understanding what is inside. Yeah. So we want to put some uh, say vector graphics or graphics, yeah. but that should be the uh, low weight, lightweight, so that this can be rendered any places with the low resource settings. Yeah. So consider as you put the images, so make it quite flexible. Yeah. So whether we can put one side, say, for example, one of the EMR, we put uh, on the patient's picture yeah. is going to the hospital in the one side. So the login in the middle. But the whole picture, the say that is what this application is for. Yeah. So that's a definitely good idea. We appreciated that what you do at last. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely something. Yeah, considering low resource, uh, net, low network resource environments is is really important for what we do. Um, and this is gives a lot of flexibility, so you can define it however you want, and and you can really optimize for that use case if that's important. Other questions. Any more questions or, or requests? Bugs, bugs <laughs> and requests, new features. I'm surprised uh, there are have... no new feature requests, no bugs. <laughs> wow. Yes, there's one more question here. Thank you. Uh, this is Najib uh, Ashari from uh, Ministry of Health, Yemen. Uh, regarding utilizing uh, multiple instances and uh, connecting different versions to exchange data. Yeah. That is that. Is there uh, any problem regarding this? Because we are running multiple instances, and uh, some are still old instances, and we are testing right now new instances, yeah. uh, new versions, and we are facing some problems. We had to go back and uh, to the old instances. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's particularly around exchanging data between DHS two systems. Um, the data exchange service that I mentioned supports uh, any, basically any version of DHS two as the target system. So, if your HMIS, for example, is is on a, a version that's that's uh, many versions back, that can be the target of that exchange service. Uh, the the source needs to be a version that supports this data exchange service for that particular way to implement. Uh, um, exchange between DHS2 systems, but we also have uh, other ways to do it with older systems as well. So you, there's a tracker to aggregate uh, script that you has been around for some time that you can use to uh, migrate tracker to aggregate data. You can also do similar scripting for between uh, any DHS2 instance and any other DHS2 instance. Um, so it, it is it is something that we think a lot about. It's, it's uh, especially uh, facilitating the upgrade process is something that is a big focus for version 41 so that you don't run into issues and you can move forward, but also that if you have multiple versions of DHS2 in your ecosystem, you can integrate them together and you can make sure that they uh, they, they continue to work. So the, yeah, the the base, basic answer, there's, there's more complex answer that we can talk about uh, offline if you'd like, um, but specifically for the data exchange service, the target system can be any version of DHS2. We have one more question from Maldives. 
Uh, hello, I'm Shama from Maldives. Uh, the, our question is that in Maldives, we are using uh, multiple programs, tracker-based programs uh, in parallel. But uh, one issue that we ha have identified is that uh, if the programs are separate from one another, uh, we are not able to pull or push data between two different programs. So this creates an issue for us. For example, we have an electronic immunization registry where the child information is there. And we are going to be working with the reproductive health, the ANC, PNC module as well. So some information in the uh, the mother and the child, we actually want to form a relationship, but they are in separate uh, programs. So uh, I hope that this could be considered as a further development later on. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good example of a, of a request with a concrete use case. That is something that we do have. The, you can do that. Uh, but you need to do some custom development to make it to make it really work at the moment to be able to do uh, an integration basically between one program and another program within DHIS2. Uh, but it is possible to do that transfer, um, and maybe Morton will talk a little bit about some ways to do that uh, with the, some of the tooling that we provide. But it is something that we could uh, look into. Uh, or we we will be looking into how to do that more natively within DHIS2 itself, um, including both improved support for relationships between tracked entities. So for example, from a mother to a child, being able to navigate between them more quickly, being able to, to see some information from a related uh, case or relate, related tracked entity from uh, the one that you're looking at, as well as the ability to, to kind of move data around within the system in a way that makes sense and in, in an automated fashion. But that's a very, very good request, so thank you. I think we have time for only one more question. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's a, a request, it's a shared request from the MENA region, yeah. uh, Mohammed, the head of his MENA. So uh, it's about the RTL, right uh, to left, uh, yeah. so to support Arabic language in the system. Yeah. So this is shared from all Arab countries. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's something that uh, I was speaking with with you and your team a little bit earlier to the, this week as well. Uh, it's something that we we definitely want to support or improve our support for. Uh, translation into many different languages is an important part of the system, and the right to left languages is something that uh, there are some small tweaks that we could make to really improve the experience for for people that are are used to or, or expecting to see an interface from the right to the left instead of from the left to the right. So we've we've done quite a bit of uh, investment in in that area additionally in um, not specifically for for arabic but uh, in ethiopia for example and nepal as well uh, support for multiple calendar systems being able to improve that support um, that's something that has it didn't make it on the slides here but that's something that is uh, improved in version 40 and is continuing to improve in version 41 as well uh, support for uh, yeah localization translation uh, and uh, different uh, di different calendar systems are all uh, of core functionality within DHS2 that we want to improve as well. Future upcoming uh, in this uh, to the whole partic NYT participants. Uh, I came to know that you are the lead of uh, DHIS2 with this app. That's very good, sir. Sir, my request would be that in uh, all parts of the world, our target audience who are using the uh, DHIS2 in field, and now it is uh, compelling because it is now digitalized, digital. digital Sorry, whatever, you got it. So the target audience is who are operating on it, the, the, the intellectual level varies. Hmm. They can't be a doctor. Hmm. They can be paramedics. Hmm. They can be, the, la uh, the language is also a barrier. As hmm. just asked by the uh, Arabic, it should be Urdu as well in Pakistan. Yeah. We are seeing in software in uh, for different apps, there is every country, but there is no Pakistan. Mm -hmm. There is no Urdu. Mm -hmm. So Urdu is for the India as well as for the 
uh, Pakistan. Mm. So it should, the more it is easy, it is easy, mm. but it's in the English language. Mm. My point of concern is that it should be for the user who will be using it in the field mm. where their uh, uh, educational level is not mm. so high. Mm. Are the words, are the data in which we are interested mm. might be, we, uh, we might be misled. Mm. DHIS2 is a very open form and we, uh, we are uh, hoping that with this, we will be entering into a new era where the data will be more accurate mm. rather than the previous DHIS. Mm. So my request would be keeping the audience in mind. It is a comment. It is not a question. And uh, last part of the, my comment would be that when are you coming to Pakistan? So that you should have the hospitality of the Pakistan. I appreciate that very much. Um, so the a, a couple of your points really resonated with me. Number one is is translation into many different languages. I don't know, Phil, if you know the number of languages that we have supported now. More that we have more than forty languages supported in DHS two at the moment, um, and we really rely on the community to help to do those translations. So for Ur Urdu, for example, uh, I would love to to get. You, the, the teams involved to help to make sure that that translation is available because we have the infrastructure in place to translate into many different languages and we'd love to to support as many as we can but but I don't speak Urdu so I uh, we need to uh, bring bring the community together to really help with that translation into all the different languages so that's absolutely something that we would love to work on yes yes yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. The last point that I wanted to make, which I think is very important on this in general, is that uh, we're really investing also in. Uh, user experience research. So actually going on the ground, talking to people who are using the system, who might be a clinician at a facility and understanding how they interact with the system and how we can make it easier to understand in their local context and uh, easier to use and e more efficient to use. So that's definitely something that we're investing in quite a bit. And with that, I think uh, it's time for lunch. So I'll turn it back over to Pamud. Right, thank you so much. So uh, as Austin mentioned, it's uh, time for lunch. But before that, so we did uh, rounds of introductions of all the Ministry of Health particip participants in the morning, but we had one team who arrived a bit late due to all logistics related issues. So we have uh, Ministry of Health Kyrgyzstan team here. Can we see where they are seated? Yes, we have the team there. Yes. Thank you so much and welcome to Sri Lanka. Right. All right. So uh, it's lunch time. So lunch will be served uh, at the back of the hall once you exit those two doors. So you can serve your lunch and come back to your uh, tables and have it. So it's uh, time for lunch. And we are going to start the next session for the post-lunch uh, session, sharp at 1.30 p.m. local time. Yeah. So we have around roughly 45, 40 minutes. Uh, yeah. Let's try to stick to time. And we will be starting at 1.30. Thank you so much. Yes, and feel free to trouble uh, Austin and Phil during lunchtime. So, yeah, they're happy to answer all your questions. <laughs>